inviting me here and Kwang Ju Choi for taking such a great care of me. I expected a warm welcome, but what I received exceeded my expectations by a lot. So thank you for having me. Okay, so this is joint work as indicated with Drago Bokal, Bruce Richter and Helasio Salazar. And this project is very old. In fact, I started thinking about it when I was a graduate student, which was which was a long time ago. So I'm going to start early. I'm going to start easy with the theorem that I hope everybody here knows, which is Kuratowski theorem that says that a graph can be drawn on the plane without crossing edges if and only if it has no subgraph isomorphic to a subdivision of K5 or of K33. Uh, so I'd like to tell you what I think about crossings, what crossings are. So first of all, all crossings refer to drawings in the plane. I'll be talking later about graphs embedded on a projective plane because it comes up. But when I say crossing, it doesn't mean crossing on the projective plane. It always means crossings on the plane. Second, edges may cross on the edges, that is, an edge cannot cross a vertex, and of course no vertex can cross another vertex, they would coincide. And also no three edges may cross at the same point, so when you count crossing you simply count one edge crossing another edge. Okay, now G is a topological minor if, of H if a subdivision of G is a subgraph of H, so in other words you can state this in the following sense that a graph can be drawn in the plane without crossing edges if and only if K5, neither K5 nor K33 is a topological minor of the graph. Okay, now I'm going to give you a standard definition of what it means for G to be K crossing critical. Well, G is K crossing critical if every drawing of that graph in the plane requires at least K crossings that is, if it requires case crossings, but it's the smallest with respect to this property. That is, if I take any proper subgraph of it, that graph can be drawn with fewer than k crossings. Now I'm going to tell you right away that I don't like this definition. <laughs> I don't like this definition because with this definition we would have infinitely many one crossing critical graphs because k5 and k33 would be one crossing critical but so would be any subdivision of such a graph. So there would be infinitely many. I don't like infinitely many, I like finitely many. So I'm going to change the definition for this talk and I'm going to say topological minor of G. Don't get too attached because I'm going to tell you in five minutes that I don't like that either. <laughs> but for, this is good for this slide, okay? And now I can restate the Kuratowski theorem that says K5 and K33 are the only one crossing critical graphs. And this is finite, I like finite. Now, even if Kuratowski didn't prove this theorem, and nobody else did, even if we did not know the list of crossing critical graphs, one crossing critical graphs, but we knew the theory of Robertson and, and, and Seymour, we would know that this list is finite because graphs which are planar are closed undertaking of minors. So the list of excluded minors must be finite. Well, the list of excluded minors can be obtained from those excluded, sorry, excluded topological minors can be obtained from the list of minors by taking every excluded minor and splitting each vertex in every possible way. So we would know that the list is finite. Perhaps we would not know exactly what, it, well, we know, but we would, okay? Now, unfortunately, this finiteness guarantee is gone. And it's gone because look at this graph. Well, this graph obviously can be drawn with one crossings. It is drawn with one crossing. And you can clearly tell that this cannot be done without any crossings whatsoever. But can you guess what is the problem with this graph? Well, if I contract this edge that goes across, what happens? It's no longer crossing number one. Now I have to have two crossings to draw this graph, which means that the class of graphs of crossing number one or less is not closed under the taking of minors. So to exhibit minimal elements outside of this class, 
I cannot use minors. So the guarantee of the finiteness goes out the window. Because each time I have, okay, so, okay. So here, basically, this is what I just said. H is a minor of G. Uh, because it can be obtained by deleting and contracting edges. If somebody doesn't know what minor is, it means you can get a minor by deleting edges, deleting vertices, and contracting edges. And so the class of graphs of crossing numbers strictly less than two is not close undertaking of minors, and there is no guarantee that the list of two crossing critical graphs is, graphs is finite. And indeed, you can see immediately that the list as described, is not going to be finite. Because each time I have a double edge, guess what? Topologically, this is not included here. This is not a topological minor. But, you know, <laughs> it's not that different, right? I mean, it, I mean, it looks like cheating. So, what I'd like to say, yeah, I like this graph to be two crossing minimal. This is honest to goodness two crossing minimal graph. This is obviously obtained from it by just doing this, this operation. So here is my revised definition for the relation that is replacing topological minor. I'm just going to call it domination. So I'm going to say G is dominated by H if it can be obtained from H by deleting vertices and edges and contracting edges instant with vertices that have exactly two neighbors. So notice, in topological minors, I'm allowed to contract an edge that is instant with a vertex of degree two. Here I'm going to say, I'm not going to count degrees, I'm going to count number of neighbors. And I'm going to get an extra loop which I can delete. Okay. So, G is cross two crossing critical if it requires at least two crossings and every graph properly dominated by G can be drawn with at most two crossings. So, at this point of the talk, the hope of finiteness is still alive. Okay, three, two, one, <laughs> gone. So, this is an example of Martin Koho that I saw a long time ago, and, well, this is of course one graph, but you can imagine that this graph can be repeated, that is, start with an odd number of those H pieces, H-like pieces, odd number, uh, here's five, you need to have at least three for this to work, so one won't work, but three, five, seven, nine, pick any odd number, and then arrange them in this way. And you can easily convince yourself, if you play with this a little bit, that this graph is indeed two crossing critical in my new definition. Um, and you're going to see a little later why this is indeed so. But this is indeed a class, you can think of it as a class. Oh, and you should, I mean, I kind of take for granted what, I, what I've been doing for a long time. You see this A and this A? It means this is the same vertex. And the B and the B, of course, that's the same vertex also. Otherwise, it becomes too messy if I try to draw everything correctly. Okay, so this graph, when you connect A and B, A's and B's together, like they indicated, this graph is non-planar. And indeed, trying to make it planar, I mean, it requires at least two crossings. Well, not hope was lost, though. And I'm speaking in the past tense because now we know what's going on. Not all hope was lost because even though we had examples like this, and this is not the only one, I could modify this example a little bit, and I'm going to tell you exactly what the modifications are. Uh, all of those known examples looked alike. So, well, of course, when something looks alike, always, there may be some reason for it. And that's what he tried to discuss. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Let's look at all two crossing critical graphs, starting from the simplest ones. That is, let's look at those which are not two connected. And so there are some obvious ones, like two disjoint copies of K5. Of course, if you have two disjoint copies of K5, each one requires at least one crossing. But now any removal of any edge drops the crossing number down to one. 
uh, two copies of K33, a copy of K33 and K5, and then one sums of those graphs in various situations. Okay, done. So we don't have to worry about graphs which are not too connected anymore. The class of graphs which are too crossing critical and not too connected is displayed exactly here. It takes no time at all. Okay, so how about graphs which are too connected but not three connected? It basically is just as easy, a little more tedious, but just as easy. Here is half of the list, uh, less than a half, and here is the bigger half. But those two lists are, uh, I'm just flashing it to you, I don't expect you to examine those graphs, but basically for all of those graphs you can identify a two separation, like two separation is here, and you can probably see you know, basically a one of those Kuratowski graphs, K5 or K33 on one side or the other, maybe with an edge missing or some subdivision going, going on. But basically this is like joining two pieces, each of which is coming from K5 and the other is coming from K33. Done. We don't have to worry about two not graphs which are not too connected anymore. So from now on, all of the graphs I'm going to look at are going to be three connected. I'm done with graphs with lower connectivity. So how do you argue that one part, each part contain K5 or K33? Because if one of them was planar, without you know, if you add an edge uh, in that in that place, then if that thing wasn't was planar, then the graph would not be minimal. You could reduce it. I mean, it requires some. Yes, it requires some thought. It's not. It's not immediate, but but it's easy. Okay. That's that. We knew this from. I knew this on my own when I looked at this when I was a graduate student. Okay, so this is the second part, as I said, and now, so now let's let's try to see what happens with the uh, graphs that are not projective. So the projective plane. Everybody knows what the projective plane looks like. Yes. Um, when I talk to my students in undergraduate classes, I like to tell them about the game of asteroids that some of you may have played on the computer, that when an asteroid escaped part of your screen, it reappeared on the other side. So they were playing on the projective plane without knowing it. <laughs> um, okay, so it's been known uh, for a while, namely Glover, Haneke and Wong, found a complete list of topologically minimal graphs that do not embed on the projective plane. Now, it's easy to see that every graph that has only one crossing or zero can be embedded on the projective plane. If it has only one crossing, that's where you put the cross cup. So all of these graphs require at least two crossings. There's a hundred or three of them, and it's very easy, I mean, time-consuming, but just to check all 103 and check which ones are indeed minimal with respect to my domination relation. That is, which of those are two crossing critical. And so all of those 103 require at least two crossings and 11 are both three connected and two crossing critical and there they are. And so if my two crossing critical graph is not embeddable on the projective plane, just say projective, then it must contain one of these things or one of those which are not as highly connected. So from now on I can assume that every graph I'm going to look at is going to be projective because the graphs which are not projective have been excluded by this. Okay, so projective graphs. Now I need to know a little bit more how a graph embeds on the projective plane. Oh, I'm sorry, but uh, what is projective plane? Projective means it embeds on the projective plane. Oh, okay. okay? Which means you can draw it on this asteroid screen. <laughs> okay, so representativity. Okay? So what is representativity? Well, suppose that a graph is embedded on a non-planar surface. Well, for our purposes, that non-planar surface is going to be the projective plane, but the definition works for any non-planar surface, uh, say a torus, Klein, bottle, and whatnot. Okay, so representativity is the minimum 
of the cardinality of the intersection of the graph itself taken as a point set with alpha where this intersection where this minimum is taken over all non-trivial curves as far as homotopy goes that is what you do is you take a curve on the surface which cannot be contracted topologically to a single point it, it, that curve has nothing to do with the graph it's not a part of the graph that is but it probably intersects the graph well you can make this intersection finite in terms of number of points because if that curve runs along an edge for a while you can disturb it slightly so it just goes through a point in fact you can move it so that it goes through just vertices and faces and so that number is a finite number and we are going to call this the representativity of the drawing of the embedding by the way the representativity on the projective plane if a graph has representativity zero well what does it mean well it means there is a closed curve which is homotopically non-trivial that completely misses the graph that means the graph is planar okay what happens if the representativity on the projective plane is equal to one well let me draw a picture of it I don't have it on the slide but here is the representation of the projective plane and here is some non-trivial curve right this is what, what the non-trivial curve looks like on the projective plane and it intersects my graph only in one point which means it intersects my graph only in a vertex somewhere so here is you can see the part of the graph here you can see a part of the graph there this is what the picture looks like but then you can represent it differently you can instead of representing it through this curve you can represent it along this curve which means you can redraw it and your picture looks like this and there is no crossings in the middle this is just a planar representation with this vertex being identified with this but then you can just draw it on the plane by just bending the thing around and you have a planar graph so representativity one on the projective plane means the graph is actually planar okay but what I'd like to talk about is representativity more than two and so in fact Vitre, who was a student of Robertson about the same time I was, he found all 15 topologically minimal graphs whose representativity on the projective plane is greater than 2. And he checked all of them, or we checked all of them, and it turns out that each one of them requires at least two crossings. So all we have to do is to check which one of those are crossing critical and we did and the following of these are two crossing critical you have five graphs and so if a graph is projective which is what we can assume from now on and it has representativity more than two on the projective plane then it must contain one of these that's it so from now on we can throw in an extra assumption into the mix we can assume not only that the graph is three connected and projective we can also say its representativity on the projective plane is exactly two one is planar I said so it doesn't and three is too much we have covered that which means the picture looks like this uh, this is a little faint but I hope you can see it this is supposed to be the boundary of the not boundary but representation of the projective plane and this this thing in the middle is where the graph goes but you cannot put any crossings there it has to embed it with the understanding that this point is identified with this point and this point is identified with that point okay so now let's talk about large graphs so this is a theorem that was not part of this project but a part of another project that I had with uh, Guoli Ding, Robin Thomas and Dirk Vertigan so Guoli Ding and Dirk Vertigan are my colleagues at LSU and Robin Thomas is a professor at Georgia Tech and so what we proved is the following that if you have a 
well, for every integer greater than or equal to 4, there is an n such that if you have an almost 4 connected graph, non planar graph, with at least n vertices. Okay, so I have to tell you what is almost 4 connected. We know what non planar means. I have to tell you what is almost 4 connected. So let's wait for a moment. I'm going to tell you in a moment, but let's, let me tell you what the conclusion is. So the conclusion is the following you can get k4k. And I'm not going to draw K4K because everybody knows what it looks like, right? Four vertices, K vertices, and all the connections between the four and the K vertices. K4K sharp. This is not a hashtag, this is a sharp. <laughs> this is what it looks like. It's basically a K4K, but each vertex of degree four is split like this. Uh, there's two more options. One is BK, uh, that's a bicycle wheel, if you will. So, of course, this is a particular version. This is a B4, that is, there is four spokes which are inside, there is a four spokes that are ice outside, and then there's a hub that joins them both. And the last one is Mobius ladder. That is, this looks like a ladder, but it's joined like a Mobius band. Okay. And almost four connected. I don't have it almost uh, four connected here, but I can tell you what it means. It means if you can find a three separation in the graph, if you can find a three separation in the graph, so you found something like this. Your graph breaks into two pieces. Here's one piece. Here's the other piece. Then you know, so then you know that at one of the sides contains just one vertex, which is not part of the separation. Okay? So if you, if you can find three separations, but those are the only three separations. That one side contains exactly one vertex, which is not a part of the separation. Okay, so let's see. Um, which of these is going to be useful. Well, we know that k for k, that this option for large k is not possible to happen in a graph which is two crossing critical. I mean, you know, if I have a graph which is almost four connected, of course my crossing critical graphs I'm going to look at are non-planar. If this graph is large enough, then it's going to contain one of these. Well, let's see which ones are possible. And the answer is, well, this one isn't really possible because K3, 4 all by itself already is a two-crossing critical. Well, you can get, um, definitely, this is not going to be possible when K is greater than or equal to 4. Um, same is true for this. For a bicycle wheel, you're going to get some small versions. For example, B3 is going to be indeed possible to be there. But definitely large, large version of this, when K is large, is going to be redundant. Some of the spokes can be eliminated. So if I have a graph that is two crossing critical and contains a large version of this, then I can show that some of the spokes are redundant. I can eliminate it, eliminate them, and still have a graph which is too crossing critical. So the only, the only options for which k can be large is this guy. So I know that if my graph is large enough, it must contain a large Mobius ladder. Okay, so now let's look at separations. So suppose a, b is a three separation of of a three connected two crossing critical graph G and let A prime and B prime be obtained from A and B respectively by adding a vertex joined to the separating vertices. So for example if I have this separation I would take the left hand side and add a vertex to make this and then I would have this part and join to the right hand side and I would look at those graphs. If my original separation separated the graph into A and B, those would be A prime and B prime. Now, if both A prime and B prime are non-planar, 
then what we have inside is K3-4. Because, in a sense, there must be a K3-3 sitting in this side, there must be a K3-3 sitting on that side, and so there must be a K3-4 when you join them together in the original graph. And this is not immediate, but this is the easy part of the project. We can actually figure out what happens when there's a K3-4. K3-4 itself is too crossing critical. But if you split the vertices of degree 4, well, depending how you split them, you may get a graph which is not too crossing critical. But the analysis is not hard. It is harder in the project we are doing with Quanju, but that's a different story. So, we are done with the case that both of these are non-planar. I said this is easy to analyze. So we can assume that each time you meet such a separation, one side is going to be planar, planar with the addition of that extra triad. So if A prime or B prime is planar, then one of them, the planar part, cannot be too complicated. If it were more complicated than, than, than what is displayed here, it would be redundant. Okay. So why, do I, why, why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this because in the previous slide, my theorem that I listed required the graphs to be almost four connected. I never said I could have, I could assume that my graphs, two crossing criticals, are almost four connected. I said I could assume that they were three connected. So if you give me now a three connected, two crossing critical graph that doesn't have K3, 4, I know that if you find a three separation, one of these guys is going to be on a smaller side of the separation. And if I replace it temporarily by a triad, that graph would be almost four connected. And so I can apply the previous theorem to it. Doesn't make sense? Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about drawings of MK. So, well, the graph MK, that is the Mobius ladder, is non planar. It contains K33 as long as you have three rungs. It is K33 when you have exactly three rungs. And it can be drawn with one crossing, but up to symmetries, there's only two drawings. This is one, and this is the other. Okay, if you want to look at this differently, you can say you could cross this edge with this edge, twist it, and that's this, uh, sorry, that's this picture. Or you could cross this edge with that edge, and that's this picture. And so now think about it. Remember the example I gave you early on about Kohl's graphs. So what we have now, we know we, we can only consider the case when there's a large Mobius ladder inside of your graph as a subdivision. So to make this graph two cross, so th you have this picture inside of it. There's subdividing vertices, there's vertices along here, and there's more graph that attaches itself as bridges to those vertices. Okay? Attaches itself to those vertices. You can think of it as a picture inside of your graph, part of it. And now all you have to do is you have to in a sense, say, what must be in that graph to prevent this from happening, that is having a one crossing like that, or having one crossing like that. Well, for example, to prevent crossing of this type, you could double this edge. That would not be a single crossing. And for every pair like this, you could double one of those edges. To prevent crossing like this, you could either double this edge or you could, you could put something in the middle here that would, you know, if this edge wanted to go like that, it would have to cross something else. And so this is quite of, this is the longest part of our paper. So this is a quite detailed analysis and I cannot do the analysis for you. It, I mean, the whole paper is almost 200 pages. So yes, I mean, com compact it to 50 minutes has to skip some details. 
significant amount. So I can just tell you what the outcome is. But I, tell, I told you basically where the analysis lies. To prevent these kind of possibilities of a single crossing, you have to block this for every such pair of edges, and you have to block this for every such pair of edges. So this is the outcome. So if G is three connected, two crossing critical, embedded with representativity two on the projective plane, and contains at least M5, which is, which is, which is also known as V10. Is that the plus no, 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 no. Either way, either way, that's, the that's a cubic graph, so topological minor or minor is the same thing. Okay. So contains, yes, not as a subgraph, I meant topological minor or a minor. Okay. Then it must look like this. And I have to explain to you what this picture means. Okay, so you are going to have, again, identification, right? So this A is the same as this A, and this B is the same as this B. So you can think of it as the whole picture being on the projective plane, uh, being too representative, with exactly vertices A and B being where the curve, non-trivial homotopically curve, intersects my graph. Okay, now what are those mysterious boxes and why some edges are red and some edges are black? Well, the black edges are edges. The red edges are not edges. The red edges could be either doubled or contracted. So pick your choice. For every edge you have to make a decision. What do you want to do? Contract it or double it? What about each of those boxes? Well, replace it with one of the following. Those are the minimal configurations preventing this edge from going across and cutting through it. So there is what? Uh, 5 plus 8 it makes 13 different, and we call them tiles. So, when you do this operation, you have to be a little careful, which I did not, didn't explain here. Uh, there is an orientation. Some of them are symmetric, like this is symmetric, so you can just stick it in place of this and not have to worry which side it's facing. Uh, this guy is not quite symmetric, so you have to be careful which there's only one orientation that would work. I'm not going to go through the details of that. But if you replace correctly each of those gray rectangles with one of these graphs, you're going to get yourself a graph which is two-crossing critical. But what's more important is that every two-crossing critical graph described by these conditions must look like this. So now let's, let's re review where, where, where we are. So we said, if our graph is large enough and is non-planar and almost four-connected, then it must contain a large Mobius ladder. If it contains a large Mobius ladder, at least M5, then it must look like this. So what do you mean by contracted? And just contracted, just, you know, like, like take a minor contraction. Like, uh, identify the endpoints and delete the edge. Oh, so you can contract? Contract. Uh, okay. I know that you know the word contract. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was that, I was thinking whether you get the red edge from something. No, 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 just... So you can identify... Identify the endpoints, yes. All right. You basically want to prevent I'm sorry, you want to prevent this edge from going across. Okay, you want to prevent this edge from going across. And one way to do it is to eliminate this edge by contracting it. Or another way to block it from just one crossing is to double it. And that's it. Okay, so from some big picture perspective, we are done in the following sense. I described to you exactly an infinite family, and told you that if a graph is large enough, then it must look like this. So there's finitely many to worry about. And in one, on one hand, I could say, ah, that's a finite problem, you know, we are done. But we are still trying to figure out exactly what that finite class looks like. Well, I told you some of the elements, those were the ones that didn't have enough connectivity, 
those were the ones that were not projective, and those were the ones that were projective, but representativity was too high. Okay, so let's see what else we can say. Well, I'm going to talk about graphs which are uh, internally for connected. So internal for connectivity is a stronger condition than almost for connectivity. The difference is the following. In internally for connected, I first I want the graph to be simple. I want it to be three connected and I want for every separation one side to have exactly three edges. So for instance, I can have a three separation where one side is just a triad, it's a claw, that is, is an induced triad. That is, if, those edges, if the picture looks like this, with those edges specifically missing from the graph, that's okay for internal for connectivity. It's also okay for almost for connectivity. But if we have a picture like this, this graph is almost for connected because I defined almost for connected as at, one, at least one side, one side having one vertex, at most one vertex, which is not a part of the separating vertices. But here, for internal for connectivity, I'm saying, well, I want one side to be at most three edges. And here, this side, if I make the separation like that, that would be one, two, three, four edges. Too many. So if you have a triad, that triad must be induced. That's what internal for connectivity means. Can I, can I move that edge to right side? No, I mean you can, but I'm saying that for every separation. So yes, you can find a separation for which this edge won't cause a trouble, but it's supposed to be for every separation. Okay, and here's a theorem. So this, the theorem is well known among graph theorists, but Robertson told me this theorem when, about 25 years ago or so, but he said he never went, went around to write it. It was just, um, you know, it's, it's there, I, I'll get around to it someday. And I've, myself, I've referenced this theorem as pri private communication because that's the only thing that I knew. And I was bugging Neil Robertson saying, could you please write it down because this is a very important theorem. It would be nice to have it in print and to be able to put reference to it. And I think J John Meharry is another of Robertson's students and I think he wrote it up for Neil Robertson. That's my guess. Okay, I don't know for, for, for certain. And so Robertson said, okay, well, so we both wrote it together. But I knew the theorem done by Robertson before Mahari, well, probably before he graduated from elementary school. <laughs> that was a long time ago, and John Mahari is fairly, fairly young. Okay, so what does the theorem say? Well, it says that if you have a graph which is internally four connected, with no V8 minor, and remember, V8 is closely related to V10, it's just, it's just like a Mobius ladder with just one spoke fewer. So if you don't have V8 minor, then the graph must f satisfy one of the following conditions. It could be planar. Well, it could be that it has two vertices whose removal creates a cycle, and those two vertices were adjacent in the first place. That's, a, that's another possibility. Possibility number four is that there is some four vertices that cover the whole graph. That is, that meet every edge of the graph. Now, in this case, those vertices need not be adjacent. Here they have to be. In the third condition, they don't have to be. Next possibility is just one weird example. Just line graph of K33. I know, if there's one weird example, 99% chance it's a Peterson graph. Now, here it's the line graph of K33. And in fact, line graph of K33 is very special for our project for crossing critical graph, for two crossing critical graph. It is a two crossing critical graph, but its crossing number is three. If you remove any edge from it, its crossing number drops down to one. 
If you, remove more, if you remove more than one, of course, it could drop down to zero. But my point is it's crossing critical, giving you this jump from three to one, skipping over two. And that's the only one. But nevertheless, that's a special case. And last possibility is, well, G doesn't have enough vertices. I mean, V8 V has, well, as the name suggests, eight vertices. So if it doesn't have eight vertices, it doesn't matter what it looks like, it cannot have V8. So some of them may be overlapped. Right? Yes, of course. So, so the conditions are not exclusive. So I said one of the following, but I didn't mean exactly one of the following. At least one of the following, exactly right. And I said here V8 minor, but V8 is a cubic graph, so if you know anything about graph minors, you would know that excluding a cubic graph as a minor is the same as excluding it as a topological minor. Okay, so what does it mean for graphs which are two crossing critical, three connected, without V8 as a minor? Well, here is a strategy. Suppose that you are given a graph which is that. That is, it is three connected, two crossing critical, doesn't have V8 minor, and on top of it doesn't have VK34 minor, because I told you we dealt with that. Not having K34 minor is useful because it says every time you have a three separation, one side is planar. <laughs> planar with the addition of a triad like this. So, it means that each time I see a three separation, I can reduce that three separation to just one vertex by replacing with a triad. Of course, I lose the fact that the graph is two crossing critical, but I'm getting some kind of a skeleton of my graph. So I'm going to replace the planar part with a triad. And what I'm going to get is, well, I don't know why we decided to call it peripheral for connected, but it's the same as almost for connected. Okay, then you have to do more reductions because theorem of Mahara and Robertson doesn't apply to almost four connected graphs. It applies to internally four connected graphs. And you have to do f further revision. Uh, okay, so in which every three separation, what puzzle? So uh, I just explain, explain again what almost four connected means. This can be further reduced to internal four connected graphs. And this is a little tricky because, you know, this is the difference, as I explained to you, between internal for connectivity and almost for connectivity is edges like this. So you say, well, just remove that edge. The problem is that when you remove that edge, you may create other vertices of degree three. And so this process may kind of cascade, although it cannot cascade for too long. We have to prove this, and this is a little tricky to do, but nevertheless, this is what happens. And so at the end of it, uh, you get um, a graph which is internally four connected. And if you look at the list of Mahari and Robertson, let me scroll back to it. Let's see what can we get. Well, if we started with a graph which was two crossing critical, of course it was non-planar. And through those reductions, it's going to stay non-planar, which means we are never going to get a graph that satisfies this. Or if it didn't have V8 to start with, we are not going to create V8 by those reductions. So it's going to stay V8 free. Uh, can it be in this category? Yes, it can. This could be one of those bicycle wheels I told you about before. This could be a cycle with a hub, another hub alternating, and an axle between the two hubs. But the point is, those cannot be too big. There's only one, I think, that is actually viable as a source, as an outcome of this reduction that I told you about. This, well, this four vertices whose removal makes the graph disconnected. So that looks a whole lot of K something four, no? Four vertices that meet everything. So again, there's only a small number of graphs that come out of this. There's some special cases of K34, so split vertices of K34. This is one graph, well, so we check it, yeah, it indeed is two crossing critical, so it's on the list, done with it. And then we have to examine all graphs which have at most seven vertices, 
that could arise this way. Of course, they have to be non-planar. So that's just a handful of, vertices, of graphs. So it means that if you go through this reduction process, you're going to end up with only few possible graphs. So now if you reverse this process, starting from those few possible graphs, you're going to be able to create all of the graphs that are two crossing critical and um, that are two crossing critical, three connected, and do not have V8 as a minor. So we understand all of those graphs that do not have V8 as a minor. So remember, I told you that those triads were replacing one of those, it was maybe about 20 something different cases. So you know, each time you see a triad, you stick one of those possibilities and you check which ones of those lead to um, two crossing critical graph. This requires a computer because there's lots of triad typically in a graph and there's 20 possibilities for each of the triads, so there's going to be lots of computation done and eliminating duplicates and so on. But I can give you a recipe on how to do this. So what's left? Oh, so I just, I just put out what, what I just told you here. So what's left? Well, what's left is the graphs that uh, so we explicitly described all two crossing critical graphs except for those that contain V8 minor. We've done those that do not contain V8 minor. And we've done those that contain V10 minor. So what's left is does contain V8, does not contain V10. Well, there's finitely many. And you may say, well, how many finitely many? I think a handful. Okay, I think a handful, but I cannot give you a specific number other than say, it's not more than three million vertices. I mean, no, that's. Just, I mean, you're laughing, of course. This is funny, but this is what I can prove. I don't think there's going to be more than twenty vertices. Okay, but you know, this is mathematics. We are not giving guesses. This is this is what we can prove. And we are working on it. I mean, we think we we should be able to finish it. But it's a large. It's it's a big project, and I'm going to tell you why. V8 is kind of slippery. It has more symmetries than the larger v MKs does. So this is a typical picture of a V8. Again, either you can think of it as drawn on the projective plane or just draw it on the plane and identify the endpoints here and here. And here's another drawing of V8. And this is not a surprise. Every of those V2Ks or MKs can be drawn in this way or in this way. No surprises here whatsoever. What, what happened here is basically we took one of those rungs and instead of running it down like here, we just ran it across like this. That's not a surprise. If, if this was the only two possibilities of drawing V8 on the projective plane, we would probably have the theorem completely finished and we would say, I can describe to you all graphs, but we can't. Because here is another drawing of V8 that does not extend itself to a drawing of V10 or larger Vs. And let, let, let me point out to you the following. Think of it like this. You take this. So here is, you can think of as this being the rim. Right? These two, I mean, of course, this is a cycle because A goes to B, which reappears here and goes back to A. So this is a cycle, boundary of the Mobius band, if you will. And here are the rungs of the ladder. And here's the same thing, except one of the rungs is stuck outside. But think about it like this. Here is your rim. Can you follow my pointer? Here's the rim. Here is rung number one, here is rung number two, here is rung number three, and here is rung number four, looking like this. And we try to pinpoint how those different edges can be blocked from crossing each other, but because of those different ways of drawing it, we have difficulty doing it. So yes, we hope to be able to completely finish it, as in give you precise recipe, but for now we have to start with the following um, a description. We know this list is finite and we know it is on the projective plane, three connected, 
true representative does contain V8, doesn't contain V10. That's the best we can do for now. So the reason why you claim it's finite is because of this theorem by Ding and you... And That's right. And we have another argument in the paper, kind of independent from it, but nevertheless, yes, there's, so there's two reasons why the list is finite. Uh, the finiteness that I gave you from that list, uh, yeah, that number here would be dwarfed by many, many orders of magnitude. Okay, so this is, this is tiny from what we knew before. And really, I mean, that shouldn't be nearly that big. As I said, I would be very surprised if any graph with more than 20 vertices shows up in this list. Thank you.